So last week, the Iwana kids led us in musical worship, which I thought was a real blessing, but the best part for me was all the children who recited verses as part of their worship. So today I thought maybe I would invite some middle schoolers to come up and share the verses they're learning, only I'm not going to have them volunteer, I'm actually going to pay them. Let me see. I'm not going to pay them much. It's my money, and I don't have a lot in my pocket. But I could use three volunteers, middle school volunteers, want to come up and recite a verse. Money. Nobody? Come on, Olivia. You're a high schooler now. Well, all right. Well, I assume you learned it once if you now know it, so that's good. Yep. Any verse out of the Bible will have the audience decide whether, you know, you did it right or give you the gong. So I got one volunteer. Anybody? High schoolers. Nobody wants money. You guys are ruining my sermon. All right. Tell me a verse, Jonah. Okay, Galatians 5, 22, 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's awesome. Yeah. How long has that verse been on your wall in your house? Uh, like, uh, I don't know. It helps, you know, to have it up on the wall. Okay, well, don't go away. I I might have more money for you. Hold on. You lost your Jolly Jolly Rancher wrapper. Olivia? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Excellent. Do you know where it is? No. Oh, well. We'll give you half a dollar. (laughs) Just kidding. All right, so now here's what I want. No, don't go away. Don't go away. Jonah, for another dollar, would you do five jumping jacks? Yeah. Go ahead. (laughs) All right. Olivia, for another dollar, would you do five push-ups? Yeah? Yeah? You guys are saving my sermon. I'm going to take them out to lunch later. Yeah. All right. I got two dollars left. For a dollar each, would you flap your wings and quack like a duck? Yeah. Yeah? All right. Quack, quack, quack. All right. All right. All right, you guys can sit down. Thank you so much. Now, what was all that about? (laughs) Everybody wants money. That's what gives it value. (laughs) Everybody loves money. That's what gives it value, right? And some of it, it's got... So much value that some of you are willing to work for it, which is good because you saved my sermon. But here's the thing about money. It doesn't do you any good until you hand it over to somebody else. Have you ever thought about that? If you want to buy something, if you want to invest to make more, or if you want to help somebody with your money, you have to hand it over to someone else. Last week, we learned about tithing. In Israel, God set a standard of each person giving back to God 10% of their income, 10% of whatever God had blessed them to have that year, which they did by giving it to the religious leaders. The Mosaic covenant which God had with Israel had very specific commands and promises about tithing. These commands and promises are not part of the new covenant which guides the church. Nowhere in the New Testament or the other earliest church writings do we find a command for Christians to give 10% of their income to the church. And here's a key takeaway for today. This is a bonus. You read the New Testament, you will find that most of the teaching about giving doesn't have anything to do with the church at all. It's about you, I mean the church as an organization, it's about you, the church, Blessing others as you see their needs. Okay? Now, on the other hand, we do see the purposes of tithing remain with us, right? We want to show proper reverence to God. We want to remember 
our dependence on God for provision and celebrate His provision. We do want to help those in need, which sometimes comes through the church ministries. And we need to cover the costs of full-time ministry workers and the other expenses of the church or the ministry. What we want to discuss today, then, is what does the Bible say about giving in the church age? Let's pray about that, and then we'll see. Father, thank you for your revelation. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you by studying what you have shared with us. Please help us today. Speak to our hearts and our minds, and bless us to understand your revelation, to take it reflect on it, pray about it, and then be guided by your word and your spirit in this area of life and in all others. We want to praise you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Why don't you turn to Luke chapter 16 if you're the type that likes to have your Bible out. We'll take a look at a passage that shows us God takes this issue seriously even in the church age. Luke chapter 16. Verse 10. Got it? Luke 16, verse 10. Jesus is speaking. He says, The one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And the one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you haven't been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? That is the riches of heaven. And if you haven't been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, we've heard that two masters teaching before, right? A few weeks ago, we were studying in Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus said the same thing. The choice is whether we want to live for God, or we want to live for the material, worldly things we can get. Do we want to use our money for God's ministry purposes, or just to consume more and more for ourselves. What's really at question is who will own your heart and your mind? Will you dwell on God and the things of God, or will you dwell on money and the material things of the world? God wants you to have a life of purpose, walking with Him, aligned with Him in His light. This also is a question of stewardship. Right from the start, God made people to be His image bearers, reflecting His character, representing Him here in daily life, reproducing His image throughout the earth, and ruling over the rest of creation in His name. Yeah, people always have a choice, okay? Will we act as good stewards for God, or will we take what He has given us and just go our own fleshly way with it? You and I do not have a Garden of Eden to tend, right? And most of us don't rule over anything more than a small backyard. And frankly, I'm losing that battle so far. But we still are God's image bearers. We still are God's stewards. He has entrusted us with a certain set of blessings, from spiritual gifts and natural abilities, personality and passions, life experiences, some time, some energy, some health. And yes, some amount of money and other material things. Maybe you own a house or a car. Maybe you own a cow or some goats. Maybe you have sporting equipment or musical equipment at home. And surely you have other things. Every good thing in your life and every good thing you have is from God. Now what will you do with it? Will you be a faithful and trustful, trustworthy steward over those resources Or will you claim control of them for your own desires? If you live a life of purpose as God's image bearer, then you will be a good steward of whatever blessings He has given you. You will find a way to use every blessing 
for the ministry of Christ. This life, in many ways, is a test of your faithfulness, your willingness to learn to walk on what we call the top line, that is, by God's revelation and faith and obedience, as opposed to the bottom line, following your impulses of the flesh. If you're not trustworthy to do as God directs with what He has given you, then you cannot be entrusted with more. In the deepest sense, Jesus is saying that if you're not faithful and trustworthy with the material wealth God has given you, then you can't be entrusted with even better blessings, like spiritual power, influence, discernment, divine insight, real responsibility in the ministry for Christ. If you aspire to really be God's man, God's woman, you want to be his representative and steward here, then you have to be honorable in how you handle even the smallest amount of material wealth. This teaching might explain why some who are faithful to devote their resources to ministry often are given more. God knows what they're going to do with it. Now, I want to stress this is not a reward, okay? Prosperity doctrine preachers will come in and say, oh, if you'll give 10% of your income to the church today, then God will bless you to be rich. Where's that in the Bible? Have they read the New Testament? No. That's not what it says. Okay? That's misunderstanding or misusing the verses on tithing. And it's totally misunderstanding the whole concept of stewardship. God's intent is not to make you wealthy so that you become self-indulgent in consumerism. God's intention is to develop you into a mature disciple and steward who uses every blessing to carry out the work of Christ. I know none of us want to be found unworthy by God, so we need to understand what exactly He wants us to do. So today we're going to look at what the Bible says about how we use money But these principles apply to all of the blessings, everything else that God has given us. He wants us to use it for His purposes, not self-indulgence. So let's talk a little bit about giving. Turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We saw a few weeks ago in Paul's letter of 1 Timothy that the love of money could take us down that wrong path of fleshly consumerism, away from God and God's ways. But that by pursuing godliness, by pursuing God's righteousness, we could learn to be content with whatever He has given us. Just a few sentences later in that letter, we find this passage, 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 17. He says, "...command those who are rich in this world's goods..." Not to be haughty or to set up their hope on riches which are uncertain, but on God who richly provides us with all things for our enjoyment. Tell them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous givers sharing with others. In this way, they will save up a treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the future and so lay hold of what is truly life. Now, the beginning of this is similar to what we said before. Don't put your trust in wealth or material things. Don't base your sense of security or self-validation in wealth. That path is empty. It leads to discontentment, anxiety, materialistic lust, sin. Instead, trust in God's provision. And here's the thing. Trust not only that God will meet all your needs, Trust that whatever set of blessings God has chosen to give you, from the thinness of your hair to the fatness of your wallet, that that set of blessings is for the best. Trust that whatever He chooses to give you is for the best. If you trust in God and you use His blessings for His purposes, you build treasure in heaven. You build relationships on earth. And you lay hold of what is truly life. That is, you learn to have an intimate relationship with God, to live by His revelation and faith and obedience, and thus to experience true spiritual life and growth and freedom within and all the spiritual blessings that come with that. You also will be 
having true spiritual life out in the world, in the community, reflecting, representing, reproducing God's image. Now, how do we take the blessings God has given us and use them for good, which also will bring us to lay hold of what is truly life, true spiritual life? Well, Paul says, be rich in good deeds and be generous givers, sharing with others. Find ways to use the blessings God has given you to bless others. Sometimes that's in the church, through the church's ministries, but also by being generous, by sharing, giving to those who have needs. This is one of the best features about living in this area, I think. You know, most of the time in Whitewater, at least, when a need arises for a family, other families rally around and take care of it before it even comes to the knowledge of the church leadership. God uses his people to bless others. In Israel, he gave specific laws about doing that. Today, he just tells us, go, take care of it. Now, that sounds like a lot of obligation. And if you're still looking in your Bible at this passage, you might be looking at that first sentence and saying, wait a minute, command those who are rich. I'm not rich. Loophole, right? Okay, but consider two things. First, while the rich have more to work with, and they're probably more influenced by their material wealth, these principles really hold true for everybody. And second, whether you feel it or not, you are rich by historical standards and even by worldly standards today. Do you know half of the world's population lives on less than $4,000 per person per year? Can you imagine that? That's unimaginable to us in this room. <laughs> you know, inflation adjusted per capita, per person income in the U.S. right now is three times as high as it was when I was born. And then it was much higher than it had been a few decades earlier. Trust me, believe me, almost everybody I know is rich by biblical standards. So this applies to all of us. But even so, we know some are better off than others, right? So I'm going to give you a little illustration here. And I hope my, the two men I use will forgive me. This, this data is totally made up. I'm just picking on two guys in the, in the congregation, all right? Let's suppose Chris Stringer over there and I'm really taking a risk because he's feeding me lunch today, so this could ruin that. But let's suppose Chris Stringer over there is very wealthy, okay, multimillionaire, and he's making, let's say, $200,000 a year. And because he slept through last week's sermon, he thinks he still needs to give the 10% tithe to the church, so he's giving $20,000 a year, all right? Now, let's support his dear old daddy, hiding behind Mike there, that Ken doesn't have any wealth because he gave it all to Chris. And he's living off government support of about 20000 a year. Now, Ken wants to give 10% just out of the goodness of his heart, even though he knows he doesn't have to. So he's giving $2,000 per year. Who then is more generous if they're both giving 10%? The one giving $20,000 or the one giving two? Well, let's take a look at something from the life of Jesus. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Mark 12, 41. This is a scene from Jesus' life. It says, Then he, that's Jesus, sat down opposite the offering box and watched the crowd putting coins into it. Many rich people were throwing in large amounts. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins worth less than a penny. I have an example of those coins here. It's so small, you guys in the back probably can't even see it clearly, right? It's just this little tiny thing made of copper. It wasn't even worth anything back then, let alone now. This is what she put in, two of these. 
He called his disciples and said to them, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the offering box than all the others, for they all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in what she had to live on, everything she had. You see, generosity is relative to what you have. It's not measured in absolute amount. Sacrificial giving is more generous than any amount of giving that doesn't require much sacrifice. It would be good if Chris gave $20,000 a year. Don't choke. I'm just, it's just an example. Right? Oh, that would help our church budget a lot if he did that. But it's only generous on his account to the degree that he has to sacrifice to give it. If Chris gave up owning a boat to give, but Ken gave up having lunch every day to give, who really was being more generous? You don't have to turn to this one. It's just one sentence. John 13, 34, Jesus said, Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Now, what terms come to mind when we describe the kind of love Jesus has for us? The first two things that come to my mind are sacrificial, right? Jesus sacrificed. He died for us. He suffered and died for us. And unconditional. Grace is offered to us without us earning it, without us deserving it. There's no, I give you grace, you give me this, right? It's a gift. So we've already talked about sacrificial giving. What would unconditional love look like? in the sense of giving. First of all, you would give to those in need, not thinking about their skin color or their gender or how much you like them, their friendliness, their sinfulness, or anything else, right? You just meet a need. Now, there might be times when you have to draw a boundary. You're not going to keep giving money to somebody who keeps going out and spending it on drugs, Right? That doesn't make any sense. So you might withhold that money until that person's willing to get real help. But even in that situation, if they were sincere about getting help, you would even pay for that help, probably. Right? You would not worry about past hurts or sinfulness or destruction. Basically, unconditional love means unconditional giving. Now, in the sense of the church, it means you don't give based on how much you like the pastor. You don't give, you don't withhold your money because the pastor gets in your face about your sin instead of flattering your ego this week. You don't give based on how much you use the ministry of the church. And you don't give based on how much you enjoy the worship services. That's not how it works. You give based on the conviction God has given you of how much to give because you want to. Okay, because you feel like you should to obey God. And here we're learning that we give sacrificially and, un- and unconditionally. Turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We'll look at a longish, long-ish passage that speaks to these issues. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The good news is that at the end of this sermon, I will not tell you that the New Testament standard is 40% or something like that, right? Not at all. You'll see. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, Now we have made known to you, brothers and sisters, the grace of God given to the churches of Macedonia, that during a severe ordeal of suffering, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in the wealth of their generosity. For I testify, they gave according to their means and beyond their means. They did so voluntarily, begging us with great earnestness for the blessing and fellowship of helping the saints. So Paul's writing about a collection they were taking to help the impoverished church in Jerusalem. And he's commending the churches of Macedonia. And we know some of them, right? Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica. Okay, those are the churches he's talking about. And he's commending them because even though they themselves were struggling with severe poverty, they wanted to give sacrificially to help the church in Jerusalem. 
Now skip down to verse 10. He says, so here is my opinion on the matter. This is to the Corinthians. It is to your advantage, since you made a good start last year, both in your giving and your desire to give, to finish what you started, so that just as you wanted to do it eagerly, you can also complete it according to your means. For if the eagerness is present, the gift itself is acceptable according to whatever one has, not according to what he does not have. So first thing is, our giving should be voluntary, and it should be out of our eagerness to help and do good. The church should never try to compel you or guilt you into giving. And I apologize, I know some of you have experienced that in churches before, and they were sinning, okay, not you. You should not allow yourself to be compelled. There is no 10% rule to enforce today. God wants you to give eagerly, to volunteer your resources, whatever they are, to the church and to his ministry. Jesus explained with that widow with the two coins. Just like that, here again we see the amount we give in dollars, absolute dollars, is not what's important. What's important is how much of a sacrifice it is for us to help other people. How much it reflects generosity. And yet nobody... Not even God expects us to give beyond our means, okay? We give as we are able. We give as we are blessed by God to be able to give. Let's read on, verse 13. Paul says, For I do not say this, so there would be relief for others in suffering for you, but as a matter of equality. At the present time, your abundance will meet their need so that one day their abundance may also meet your need, and thus there may be equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. One feature of Christ's church is that we take care of each other. And this is so important a concept that it extends beyond our local church to other local churches around the world. Just like the Corinthians and the Macedonians, we give a good portion of our church budget to other churches around the world where we can promote the gospel mission in a place where the church couldn't survive without help, where they need the resources even more than we do. And it should be even easier emotionally for us to help those we know in our own community here. If one of us loses his or her job, I hope we would step up and meet any necessities. If a family's house burns down, I hope we would take them in. Some of our general giving to the church is available for benevolence help. We're helping someone right now. And that help can be for people inside the church, and sometimes we help people outside the church who live in this area. And sometimes we take up special collections, like for new moms who are getting help at the pregnancy center. While it's praiseworthy to give sacrificially, and our generosity is measured by the sacrifice, We again see here that God does not expect us to go without what is necessary. The quotation is from Exodus, when the people were gathering manna. Though some had collected more and some had collected less, they all ended up with what they needed. The hope is that while we have more than we need, we can give today to help others. And then down the road, if the situation is reversed, then they can give to help us. You know, there have been times in my life when I was extremely poor. And the worst of those times, I had no money and no income. So basically, I was sleeping on people's couches and living off my family and friends. Other times, I had a little money coming in, but not enough. And so it was very challenging to try to give any to the church. But once I got right walking with Jesus, I wanted to give. And so sometimes I did give up meals so that I could give a little bit. And I volunteered a lot because I didn't have much money. Now I can give more. And I delight in it. Because this is how it works. When we have much, we give more. When we have a need, we receive. That's God's economy. So don't be embarrassed when you need to receive. But don't be embarrassed about giving out of your riches either. We have one more passage to consider today, and this is so good. You're going to like this one, all right? 
It's one more chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So just turn one page, you should be there. Paul was still talking about the needs of the church in Jerusalem. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6, we're going to read through the first half of verse 11. He says, my point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each one of you should give just as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that because you have enough of everything in every way at all times, you will overflow in every good work. Just as it is written, he scattered widely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. Now God, who provides seed for the sower and bread for food, will provide and multiply your supply of seed and will cause the harvest of your righteousness to grow. You will be enriched in every way that you may be generous on every occasion. Now, Paul's doing something poetic here. He's intertwining two concepts. He does it, he says point A, and then he talks about point B, and then he goes back to A, and then he goes back to B, and then he goes back to A. Okay, I've tried to show that, if you can tell the difference between yellow and white print up there. So let's take each one of them in turn and look at them more closely, okay? We'll start with point A. I'm going to read it again, just the verses that apply to point A. My point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. And God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that because you have enough of everything in every way at all times... You will overflow in every good work. Now, God who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your supply of seed and will cause the harvest of your righteousness to grow. You will be enriched in every way so that you may be generous on every occasion. In the Mosaic Covenant, God said that if people honored the tithe and obeyed his other commands, then he would bless them, especially with provision, including fruitful harvests and multiplication of their animals. This promise here is very similar, but there are some important differences. First, what is it we reap in this passage? The metaphor is from the farm, right? The more seed you sow, the more grain you harvest or reap. But what does the metaphor represent? I contend that this does not say that if you give more to the church, God will bless you with more wealth. Look at the context. What is he talking about? He's saying the more you invest in Christ's ministry, the more fruitfulness of that ministry you will realize. As a church, we want to reap a harvest of people coming to faith in Christ and then growing in Christ and learning to live like Christ. We want to help people who are lost, despairing, sinful, grow to be true, mature, multiplying disciples of Christ. As we sow, so shall we reap. But even individually, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. If you want to get to heaven, you will get, this has had nothing to do with getting, let me rephrase that. If when you're in heaven... You want to see that you made an eternal difference for Christ. Then you have to invest in the ministry. And that means committing your time, your effort, your money, and any other resources God has blessed you to have to doing, pursuing evangelistic outreach among the lost. Engaging in edification ministries with believers here in the church and exalting God in our worship. But there's even more to this promise. God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that because you have enough of everything in every way at all times, you will overflow in every good work. Now, certainly that implies that God can bless you financially so you can give more. But whether with money or spiritual gifts or natural abilities or anything else, 
if you are a good steward of his blessings, he might decide to invest more in you so that you can invest more in the ministry so you can overflow in every good work. Putting these thoughts together, Paul concludes by saying that the God who provides both the seed and the harvest will provide and multiply your supply of seed and will cause the harvest of your righteousness to grow. You will be enriched in every way so that you may be generous on every occasion. Don't miss that ending. God will bless you so that you may be generous on every occasion. He wants you to be generous sacrificial in your giving. Let's look at the other point, point B. There's only two verses in this one. Each one of you should give just as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. And I think that means God loves that we give cheerfully, not he only loves people who are cheerful, okay? Just as it, as it is written, and this is Psalm 112, verse 9, it's talking about the man of integrity in that psalm. He, the man of integrity, has scattered gifts widely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. It has an impact. As I said earlier, the church should not try to compel you or guilt you into giving more, nor should you let yourself be so compelled. Rather, God wants you to be a cheerful giver who is giving out of your own conviction by the Holy Spirit that this is the right thing to do. Your own eagerness to contribute to the church, to the ministry, is why you give. Now, sometimes when we give, maybe we do it a little grudgingly. We might gripe in our own minds a little bit. Sometimes this happens to me. I don't want to give more money. I don't want to give up buying stuff for myself or investing in my future. Honest, I have those thoughts sometimes. So how do we handle that? Well, partly, again, we go back to the purposes for the tithe, right? They were giving to show reverence to God, to admit their dependence on God, and to celebrate His provision, to help those in need, which some of which can only be met through an organization like the church, and to take care of the cost of ministry, including full-time ministry workers. But I also remember that God has given us 100% of what we have. So if he asks for some back, we shouldn't complain, right? And if he asks for some back so that he can use it to bless us, and to bless every other person in this room, and to bless other believers around the world, and to get the gospel out to all of those who need to hear it, well, then we certainly shouldn't complain. I mean, we should be eager to give to a church that is pursuing evangelism, edification ministries, and the exaltation of God. The other problem is some of us don't give at all or very little. And sometimes this is just negligence. You know, back when we were struggling, we set a certain amount we would give, and years go by and we never think about adjusting that. Sometimes it reflects that grudging heart that we just discussed, and sometimes it reflects ignorance of God's expectations. You know, one time, friends of mine who were parents, they had a three-year-old boy, I think he was three, and they gave him some money, like I gave the teens this morning, three dollars, I think it was, and they asked him, do you want to keep that now, or do you want to give it to someone else and help him? What do you think he said? Keep it, right? <laughs> He's three. But that same little boy, not long after, brought in a milk bottle with his own coins in it to give to the pregnancy center because they were teaching him God's ways. We are learning God's ways and God's expectations. He wants us to be spirit-led, to be generous, sacrificial, and to be cheerful about it. That's the hardest part. Look, it's not like God needs your money, right? He doesn't. He doesn't even need you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need any of us to accomplish what he wants to get done. But God grants us the privilege of working through his people. He works through us. He grants us the privilege of being his image bearers, reflecting his character by being generous and selfless, representing him by imitating the example of Christ 
his sacrifice and generosity. Reproducing his image by investing in the church that carries out the Great Commission and ruling as his stewards by using his resources for his purposes. God wants to bless you, not necessarily with financial wealth, maybe, but certainly with spiritual and emotional wealth so that you can experience the joy, the peace, the hope that comes from intimacy with Him, living by faith and obedience, so that you can experience Him working in you to grow you and through you to bless others. So we give because God commands it. He expects it. But we also give because we want to bless others and we want to make an eternal difference for Jesus. And because ultimately, this is the path that will lead to our own greatest blessing. Let's read a little more of this passage. We'll see more results of our giving. Verse 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you may be generous on every occasion which is producing through us thanksgiving to God, because the service of this ministry is not only providing for the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing with many thanks to God. Through the evidence of this service, they will glorify God because of your obedience to your confession in the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your sharing with them and with everyone. And in their prayers on your behalf, They long for you because of the extraordinary grace God has shown you. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. So our giving meets real financial needs of the ministry and of others. Our giving encourages others in faith, resulting in greater praise and thankfulness toward God. Our giving helps promote the gospel mission, making it more visible and credible. Our giving bonds us with others in the church, resulting in greater prayer support and fellowship. And earlier in this letter, Paul says that our giving actually encourages others to give. Now in Acts 20, you don't have to turn there, but in Acts 20, verse 35, Paul said, remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I'm sharing all this with you this morning, not to compel you or harangue you or guilt you, I'm not even trying to convince you (laughs) to give more to the church. I'm offering this teaching so you can walk better with God, so that you can live life on that top line, responding to revelation with faith and obedience, so that you can reap the blessing of being in God's light. If the church had more money, sure, we could do more ministry. But you know what? God has provided for the needs of this church for 140 years. We don't need a teaching like this for the church. This is not about the church's health. It's about our health. So, how much should you give? The big question, right? Well, there's no New Testament standard. Lan and I decided when we got married that we would try to give 10% of our income to the church. So we try to do that. And sometimes we give more to missionaries and Christian ministries, seminary students. I looked it up this week. The median income in Butler County is about the same as my salary, which is part of the design of my salary. So I think some families could give 10% and not struggle too much. But, you know, there's lots of other aspects to this decision. For example, the poverty level is $6,000 per person. So those of you with five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten kids, and we have a lot of big families in this church, right? You may have as much income as I have, but it's not as easy for you to get by. And that has to factor into your decision. If you're struggling to get by because you have eight kids, then you give a lower percentage of your income, and that is okay. Nobody in this church is going to come get in your face about it. And if they do, you come tell me, and I will thump them. All right? We are not under the Mosaic Covenant system of tithing. It's okay to start giving where you can. And then next year, you pray about it, and maybe you can give a little more. If you have much, well, then maybe... 
you should consider whether 10% is enough. You know, again, I'll use myself. Leanne and I cheerfully give a lot in absolute dollar amount. But it'd be hard to make the case that we're sacrificing at all. I mean, what am I giving up to give to this church? I'm giving up owning a boat, maybe. But I have a nice house over there. I mean, it's not a castle. That would be cool. But it's a nice house with a two-car garage with two cars in it. Obviously, I'm getting enough to eat. All right? I'm not suffering. I'm not even sacrificing. And that implies that Leanne and I are not as generous today as we were when we first got married. And it was a sacrifice to give. So maybe God is telling us that we should at least consider upping our amount, our percentage a little bit. And maybe he'll say that to some of you if you pray about it, but maybe not. Maybe you'll pray about it and God will say, you know what? You're giving too much to the church. You need more to take care of your family or you need more for other things like giving to Wheat State or the pregnancy center or missionaries overseas. You have to pray about it and be led by the Spirit. Now you know the biblical teaching. So I do encourage you, pray. Let the Holy Spirit guide you into generous but also cheerful level of giving. We as a church will reap what we sow into the ministry. So money, time, energy, brains, whatever God has given you, we hope that you will, as much as you can, come and be part of the team. But seriously, all I'm asking of anybody today is that you pray through it. And then do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Because that's what you should do. Let's pray about it right now. God, thank you for... Well, first of all, thank you for your blessings. I mean, we're, we're eternally blessed in Christ, right? Jesus coming, dying for us on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins. And you offering us that forgiveness, that reconciliation with you free as a gift of grace. And thank you for the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit inside them, connecting them to you so that we can always be led if we're, if we're yielded. We may not sense we're being led, but we can be led in making our decisions. But you've blessed us with a lot more too. I am thankful for my material blessings. I'm thankful for my family. We're thankful for this church and this building, which is debt-free. You've blessed us greatly. And we're thankful and we praise you. And Lord, we want to be a part of the ministry. We do want to make an eternal difference. And we're glad that you don't ask us to give up everything. That even if you don't want us to be self-indulgent, you don't mind that we enjoy the blessings we have. You just ask us to use them for your ministry as well. So please help us to figure out how to do that. Help me personally to make evangelism more a way of life, inviting people to my house, not just one more thing on my to-do list. And bless us to know, to sense, Lord, from these scriptures and from the Holy Spirit, how you would have each family give this year, next year, the year after that, whatever. Thank you that we don't need to beg for money, that we're doing fine. Lord, I pray that all of us would just sense your leading and get right with you on this issue. We love you, God.